Jaya Radha Gopi jana bala bha giri vara dhari Gopi jana bala bha Just Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Kunjabi Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Vishnu Pad Paramahansa Parivijaka Charaja. Sri Mada's Divine Grace is Bhakti Vedanta Swami Shina Prabhupada Ki. Ananta Koti Vaishnava Dinda Ki. Sri Krishna Janmastri Mahamahotsav Ki. Gaur Premanandi. I'm looking for the section, be patient, a few moments. Um, we're going to read Krishna book. I'll read a few paragraphs and speak something. Maharaj, read a few paragraphs and speak something on the advent of Lord Krishna. And yesterday, this place I'm looking for is yesterday, I was in Los Angeles and that's what they were doing in Los Angeles. We read some paragraphs from chapter two. Okay, here we go. And it's the morning of Krishna's appearance. And we're in the prison house of Kamsa along with Vasudev and Devaki. Kansa has just uh, contemplated killing Devaki, decides that won't, that won't be good for my reputation. Hmm? And he becomes Krishna conscious, not a devotee. Krishna conscious and Prabhupada ends that section saying the difference between the devotee and the not devotee is favorably and unfavorably. So this is chapter two prayers by the demigods for Lord Krishna in the womb. At that time, Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva accompanied by great sages like Narada 
and followed by many other demigods, invisibly appeared in the house of Kamsa. They began to pray to the Supreme Personality of Godhead and select verses which are pleasing to the devotees and which award fulfillment of their desires. The first words they spoke acclaimed that the Lord is true to his vow. As stated in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna descends to this material world just to protect the pious and destroy the impious. That is his vow. The demigods could understand that the Lord has taken his residence within the womb of Devaki to fulfill his vow, which was made 125 years later, but that's okay. It's eternal Bhagavad Gita. And they were glad that the Lord was appearing in order to fulfill his mission. Paragraph. Then the demigods addressed the Lord as Satyam Param, or the Supreme Absolute Truth. Everyone is searching after the truth. That is the philosophical way of life. The demigods give information that the Supreme Absolute Truth is Krishna. One who becomes fully Krishna conscious can attain the Absolute Truth. Krishna is the Absolute Truth because unlike relative truth, he is truth in all three phases of eternal time. Time is divided into past, present, and future. Krishna is truth, with a capital T, always past, present, and future. In the material world, everything is being controlled by supreme time in the course of past, present, and future. But before the creation, Krishna was existing. And when there is creation, Everything is resting in Krishna. And when this creation is finished, Krishna will remain. Therefore, he is the absolute truth in all circumstances. If there is any truth within this material world, it emanates from the supreme truth, Krishna. If there is any opulence within this material world, the cause of the opulence is Krishna. If there is any reputation within this material world, the cause of the reputation is Krishna. If there's any strength within this material world, the cause of such strength is Krishna. If there's any wisdom in the material world, the cause and education within the material world, the cause of such wisdom and education is Krishna. Oh, it's called Krishna book. Therefore, Krishna is the source of all relative truths. I'll read just one word paragraph. <clears throat> this material world is composed of five principal elements, earth, water, fire, air, and ether, and all such elements are emanations from, you guessed it, Krishna. The material scientists accept these five primary elements as the cause of the material manifestation. But the elements in their gross and subtle states are produced by Krishna. The living entities who are working within this material world are products of his marginal potency. In the seventh chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, it is clearly stated that the whole manifestation is a combination of two kinds of energies of Krishna the superior energy and the inferior energy. The living entities are the superior energy and the dead material elements are his inferior energy in its dormant stage. Everything remains in Krishna. So say just try to say just a few things and keep it limited so we 
can hear something further. Mm. Prior to Prabhupada's presenting Krishna book, like some other themes that he repeated again and again, one of those themes he repeated again and again was the unscrupulous Bhagavat reciters that go to the tenth canto, speak about Krishna out of contact, without proper understanding, and you know, basically shame on them. One should approach the tenth canto by reading first the first nine cantos in sequence. And over and over and over again. But you know, we didn't we didn't know anything about anything. We're just hearing his words. Certainly Prabhupada knew what was going on in India and he knew what was going to be happening outside of India. So his audience was largely the world, which are people outside of India. So he wanted his innocent audience to understand you have to know the first nine cantos before you can understand the tenth canto over and over again. And then, surprise, he took a break from his commentary on the sequential cantos and went right to the tenth canto and published Krishna book. And at least my understanding of why he did that was he didn't know if he would be able to complete the whole twelve cantos and he wanted to leave behind him a proper understanding of the tenth canto. And so emphasis, it pablamized emphasis to make sure that the reader understood Krishna in the proper context, which is established for the first nine cantos. But for those that aren't going to read the first nine cantos, and whether he would get to complete that or not, he was making this available. Another point is the Prabhupada called like nectar devotion is a summary study of Rupa Goswami's Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, which Prabhupada in his own words said, that means I can write whatever I want. I mean, he followed section by section the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, but he helped the reader his students in the world to understand the message in a, in a proper way. So he did the same summary study of the 10th canto in a summary way, making special care to make sure that when it went to Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan, for example, killing demons and lifting Govardhan Hill and everything else, performing Rasa dance with the gopis, it would be understood in the proper context. At least to give the, his audience, the world, an opportunity to understand in the proper context. So these prayers of the demigods are very important before Krishna's appearance. The whole thing is very important, but to understand the divyam, the transcendental nature of Krishna's janma and Krishna's activities. Janma karma chime divyam. Evam yoviti tattvataha. Tattvataha, in truth. So he's helping his audience understand in truth the appearance of Krishna, which is tonight at midnight. So this, the scene is the prison house of Kamsa, and the demigods have come to offer their prayers. And... Um, there's a, it's a lot of prayers. There's different different sections in Srimad Bhagavatam where the demigods are offering prayers. For example, the, the prayers of the demigods to Lord Shringadev. Take some time, some time, and look carefully at each demigod and what each demigod is saying. And they're speaking from the lens of their position and their relationship in relation to 
Lord Vishnu or the personality of Godhead, in this case Krishna, they're demigods. So they're, they're, that means they're great devotees. And it means they're, there's a mixture. They're not on the same level of devotion as Vasudeva and Devaki, for example. They're unmixed devotees, and the demigods are great devotees, but not in the same standard or platform as Vasudeva and Devaki and the other associates of Krishna in his pastimes. But they, they have profound realization of his divinity because they're demigods, and they're, as demigods, their function is maintaining the affairs of the creation. So they really have to get it right that the creation isn't theirs. They're the managers of some aspect of Vishnu's creation. You can't get that one wrong if you're going to be a demigod. Because it could make havoc. So they're, they're the, the, before the, they offer their prayers, Prabhupada is doing the same thing as the prayers, which is making it very clear the divinity of Krishna without reviewing all of that. So he, just here, Lord Shiva and Lord Brahma and Narada, mentioned by name, great demigods, great sages, the, the topmost persons in the affairs of the universe have come. And invisible, they're offering prayers. And the very first prayer, interestingly and appropriately, is the same as the very first verse of the whole Srimad Bhagavatam, Satyam Param Dimahi. Satyam Param Dimahi. I'll, there's so many things to say, I'll just try to keep it short. Dimahi, that word Dimahi, it's a, one of many words that indicate meditation upon. Just like in the Eightfold Yoga system, there's three of the eight that are indicating meditation upon Dhyana, Dharana, and Samadhi indicating stages or types or degrees of intensity of absorption in meditation. The word Dimahi has a very special connotation in Sanskrit. It indicates Gayatri, which is a meditation upon Satyam Param. Satyam Param is the highest truth. Satyam Param, highest truth, transcendental truth, the absolute truth that from which everything comes, which is what the Vedas are searching for, that from which everything comes, is what Gayatri is a meditation upon, that from which everything comes, and the demigods are indicating Krishna is Satyam Param. And to embellish it, Prabhupada is indicating there are relative truths, but a relative truth doesn't mean it's not true, it just means it's relative to something else that's true. And then that something else that's true is relative to something else that's true is relative to something else. And what's that truth that everything else is resting upon that's not relative to anything else? That's the absolute truth, and the absolute truth is Krishna. The, the English word truth has a, at least the common connotation is in opposition to a lie. You know, a definition by negation. Well, it's, it's the opposite of what a lie is. You speak the truth. There's other meanings within Vedic culture of speak the truth. One of the speak the truth is you give, you say something you uphold your word. You say, you take a vow, you uphold your word. Dasrath gave a vow 
that he would promise Kaikei two boons, whatever it was, and he couldn't break his vow, or etc. When you speak something, you must do that something. That's another connotation of the word truth. And then this other, that's the context here, is truth, matak parataram nanyat kinchit asti dananjaya, from Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says, there's no truth superior to me. This is another particular meaning of the word truth. It's that from which other things come or that upon which other things rest. There isn't, a, there isn't some truth upon which Krishna rests. All other truths, realities, rest upon him. Okay, so like we're, we're here in the temple room. That's a truth. But some time ago, there wasn't a building here. And some time later, there isn't going to be a building here. But we're in the temple room. It's a truth. It's a relative truth. Krishna is, is not a relative truth. There isn't anything that, you know, as, as he's, Prabhupada is saying here, past, present, and future, he's always the truth. And in all phases of time and in all phases of circumstance, whatever there may be on, in this world that is whatever it is, the list is given. The, the, the source of that, the basis of that is Krishna. So the, the, the demigods are establishing these things. He, Krishna hasn't appeared yet, but they know that he's going to appear, and he's the upholder of his word. He's, that, that sense of truth is, is explained here. He gave his word or promise. I'm going to appear from time to time when there's this, this, and this, and he, here he's fulfilling his word. Or... He promised to the demigods, Lord Vishnu promised to the demigods, he'd appear to take care of Kamsa. And the overabundance, the burden of demoniac kings on earth, and here he is in the womb of Devaki. They know that. And they're offering prayers to him. Later, Devaki says to her husband, I'm hearing voices, like whispers. And I think it's something auspicious <laughs> because they're, according to the Krishna book here, they were invisible, visible, making some sound. So Krishna is the highest truth in all phases of time. He's the highest truth in the sense that everything that's a relative truth comes from him. He is therefore worshipable. I mean, for an honest person, dishonest person is another thing, but an honest person, when you actually understand such and such is the source of everything, what do you do? Bhajante Mam, you engage in his service. That's what the demigods are doing. And that's what, the, so the, the Krishna book is helping the reader, Prabhupada is helping persons that know nothing about nothing understand what they should be doing because worship is something that we'll do if we don't know who the source of everything is according to the modes of nature we'll worship it's directly in Bhagavad Gita faith is reposed somewhere worship is reposed somewhere it's just of the soul connected to the source of everything you're very fortunate and hearing this message of Krishna book makes people fortunate. I'll just say one other thing and give the book to Maharaj. <clears throat> In the first chapter of Canto 10, um, there, there's a series of glorifications of or by Maharaj Prikshit because he's heard the nine cantos from Shukadeva Goswami and um, 
including the, the lineage of kings from the, the Sun Dynasty and the Moon Dynasty. And when it comes to Krishna appears in the Moon Dynasty, Maharaj Prikshit, he has about a day and a half left in his life, but he's so enthused in describing that the topics about Krishna are such that even if one is diseased and the material condition of life is a disease, it's the best medicine. But sometimes best medicine is bitter. You know, at least if it's the herbal kind or the natural kind, other pills, you don't even know what it is. So, but bitter, it's not bitter medicine, it's very sweet. Mano biramat. It's pleasing to the ear. Shrota. Mano biramat. It cures the material disease. And it brings attraction for the topics of Krishna such that you don't want to stop. But I'm going to have to stop so Maharaj can speak. And speaking it and hearing it done properly, it's so nice. It, there, there's no point of satiation. Like, you know, with eating, when, when eating, you, there's, there's a certain point when you, can, you can't eat anymore. But with the sound vibration, there's no point where you can't hear anymore. Well, unless, the, the verse says, unless you're an animal killer, or but if, you, if you're not in that category, so, so sinful, even persons that are animal killers, they can become purified. They may not be able to go on indefinitely to hear, but they can become purified because the message is such good medicine. So it's good for the sinful people, it's good for the sadhakas, and it's good for the perfected souls. That's this that's Krishna book, it's good for everybody. Were you distributing Krishna books when the Krishna books came out? That was 1970. Krishna book came out in the 70s. I wasn't even in the movie. Oh, just a little sharing. We had, um, there were four of us, without the name, I remember the names of our Sankirtan party. And we packed the van so there, you know, there wasn't even room in the van other than the books. And we kind of waddled down the roadway to stop at this place and that place and showed people that, that, that big silver color cover book with the big Radha and Krishna and the big, you know, Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead and introducing people to the 10th canto, just, you know, anywhere, anybody, you know, unqualified. We were, we were puzzled. I mean, now it's kind of, we got, the devotees got used to it, but at that time it was, whew. it was, it was so blissful understanding, you know, where people were coming from and what they were getting and putting the two together by the mercy of Prabhupada. That, that's, that's Krishna book. So, So we continue where Maharaj left off. The demigods continue to offer respectful prayers unto the supreme form of the personality of Godhead Krishna by analytic study of the material manifestation. 
What is this material manifestation? Question mark. It is just like a tree. A tree stands on the ground. Simi, the tree of the material manifestation is standing on the ground of material nature. This material manifestation is compared to a tree because a tree is ultimately cut off in due course of time. A tree is called Vriksha. Vriksha means that which, that thing which will be ultimately cut off. Therefore, this tree of the material manifestation cannot be accepted as the ultimate truth because it is influenced by time. But Krishna's body is eternal. He existed before the material manifestation, is existing while the material manifestation is continuing, and when it will be dissolved, he will continue to exist. Therefore, only Krishna can be accepted as the absolute truth. So here again, as Maharaj emphasized, the emphasis continues to make the point that everything outside of Krishna is temporary. Temporary means that it has some value only at a certain point. Only at a certain point. But then when it disappears, it no longer can act within the realm of truth because it is no longer existing. So we say this material world is temporary, but it has some value because it allows for one to practice the process of devotional service so we can re use the temporary to reach the eternal. So you have two things, three things actually. You have you, which is eternal. You have the process of devotional service, which is eternal, and then you have the temporary material elements, which combine to make different forms, and you use those in the service of the Lord. And then something happens. As soon as that material temporary manifestation becomes engaged in devotional service, it takes on another, what we say, substance or what we say it no longer is material and then becomes spiritual or it's that which connects ones to the spiritual and therefore it is also spiritual so everything in this world has value only when it's used in the service of the lord otherwise the temporary value comes and goes just like Prabhupada would talk about that Famous story. Should I tell this story? You sure? Don't leave. <laughs> and truth and beauty. Remember that story? Prabhupada wrote this story as a Back to Godhead issue back in the 1940s. It was one of his first issues. And someone was saying that truth is very beautiful. And that is true, but then again, the question is, what is actually truth? And then that was never clarified by the previous author. And so Prabhupada wanted to make a clarification, what is actually truth? So there's a particular story that kind of illustrates this, where there's one king, and he, he decides to go riding through his kingdom to just to meet the inhabitants of the kingdom. So he goes to different places and he sees a little cottage, a little dwelling that he doesn't recognize. So he decides to stop and see who resides there. So he gets off his horse. Now he's young and he's just become king. He's like a prince that now is the ruler. And he knocks on the door and then this very attractive lady opens the door and immediately he loses his reasons for coming. He becomes infatuated by her beauty. So much so that he can't resist and he says that I, you know, I am the, actually the prince, the king of this area and actually you're a very young, beautiful lady. Actually, uh, you should become my wife. <laughs> Yeah, 
love at first sight. We heard that before. And so she's kind of saintly, a very saintly person, and also not interested. <laughs> but then she, she's at the same time thinking, I can't say no, because he will become a fender and he may even become angry. So she's a little embarrassed on how to deal with his advances. And so she says, actually, okay, um, I, you come back in one week and I will be ready. Something like that, anyway. <laughs> so he's like all enthusiastic. He can't even ride his horse now. He's kind of high on the idea that here's his, my next love. And so he's counting, there's 168 hours in a week, and he's counting every second of every hour. And then finally the time comes and he's on his way. But she decides to teach him a little lesson, a lesson in reality. So she saw, she's thinking, he's attracted to my beauty. Hmm, I'll have to give him my beauty. So she decides to perform a little, what we say, austerity. And she takes purgatives and various types of laxatives, and then all kinds of substances start coming out of her body. But what does she do with them? She collects them in buckets. And she saves all of these wonderful things that make up her beauty and puts it in a nice bucket. And she keeps it in the back room of the house. So the time has come, he can hardly wait. He jumps off his horse. He, now he's gonna be with his eternal lover. He knocks on the door and she answers. And he says, excuse me, can you, where is that young lady that lives here? She says, it's me. He, she says, no, don't joke with me, old lady. Where is that lady that lives here? Hmm, don't you recognize me? And then start things start to click and he starts to say, It is you. What happened? She said, you're so in love with my beauty, I wanted to give it to you personally. <laughs> so please come back and I will hand it to you in bucketfuls. <laughs> And then, of course, that ends the story. <laughs> Everyone gets the message. <laughs> so Prabhupada uses this story to explain, <laughs> Hare Krishna, <laughs> to explain, you know, that, you know, truth is actually beautiful, but what is actually, what is actually truth? So temporary truth, by definition, is not truth, although it has some relative value within a certain context of time. When, but actually something that it is, as Maharaj was saying, something that always exists, past, present, and future, and that's Krishna. And that's Krishna, and that's devotional service to Krishna. That never changes. It only becomes better as a devotee engages in devotional service. So therefore, this, this is a little bit of a lesson and not to get attracted to the temporary truths of this material world, because the real truth is something that is always full of knowledge, full of joy, and what we say, everlasting existing. And that's Krishna. And that's our relationship with Krishna also. So Prabhupada, um, the demigods here want to make a point that it is actually this material world is, what we say, temporary. But we are eternal. That's the point. We're in a very odd situation. We live in a world that is temporary, but we are eternal. We want happiness eternally, but everything here becomes temporary. So we can only find that in Krishna or in service to Krishna. So then it goes on. And the Katha Upanishads also cites this example of the trees of the material manifestation standing on the ground of material nature. 
This tree has two kinds of fruit. So here we're hearing more about the material world. Distress and happiness. So that point is made. Wherever you find one, you'll find the opposite. I think Maharaj was making that point when he was talking about truth, that when people say, I speak the truth, that means it's the opposite of a lie. So it doesn't really define the truth because the opposite is just the opposite. It's not really this. Just like sometimes we say, you're not this body. Well, that's nice, but doesn't help you much. Then who am I? Am I your body, that body? Am I somebody or anybody? Maybe a nobody. <laughs> but you're something that is not part of this material body you live in, and that is... The definition of positive is truth, and that is we're Krishna, we're eternal spirit, soul, part and parcel of Krishna. That's our re real identity, and that never changes. Those who are living in the tree of the body are just like two birds. One bird is the localized aspect of Krishna known as Paramatma, and the other bird is the living entity. So in that tree there's two birds. You and God. <laughs> the living entity is eating the fruits of this material manifestation. Sometimes he eats the fruit of happiness and sometimes he eats the fruit of distress. But the other bird, Krishna, is not interested in eating the fruit of distress or happiness because he is self-satisfied. The Kathi Upanishad states that one bird on the tree of the body is eating the fruits and the other bird is simply witnessing. So God is watching us within the heart. Some people say, well, how does God know everything? Because there's so many things going on everywhere and existence and creation is so vast. But because he's in the heart of every living being. So he's there. He's right there fully in his manifestation as the witness of everything. The roots of this tree extend in three directions. This means that the root of the tree is the material modes of nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance. So the, this is the basis of how this material world is constituted. It's constituted in three aspects of itself, but it's one. So it has three modes, that means it has three types of influences upon the living entity. People are influenced by laziness, sleep, intoxication, and self-destruction. People are influenced by a strong drive for material acquisition, um, a strong drive to become known within the material realm power, fame, opulence, of a strong drive to enjoy the senses as much as possible. And also, the, the mode of passion also has this element of creativity. And people who are very passionate also have a tendency to be very creative, too, in a material sense. So, so these are the characteristics of the modes of passion and ignorance. Now, there's another mode, which is the mode of goodness, which is characterized by knowledge, serenity, religiousness, activities that are moral and are directed towards God. Um, what else are some of the characteristics of the mode of goodness? A person is somewhat satisfied with their material existence. Although the influence of the other modes sometimes attack the mode of goodness and therefore things change. But we're talking just for the sake of definition. So these are the three modes. So we can really understand how things work in this world simply by understanding these modes. In the Bhagavad Gita in the 14th chapter, Krishna very carefully explains the modes and how they each work and how they influence the different living entities. And therefore, by understanding this, you can understand your own self in terms of your own activities, and you can also see others, how they're affected by the material energy. 
So it's more like a, a what we say, a vision, a lens to see how things are moving in this material world. And Prabhupada would also say, everything is happening by the modes of material nature. But then Krishna says, I am the controller of these modes. Maya Dakshena Prakriti Suyate Sucharacharam Hetu Nanduda Kunteya Jagadvi Parvi Partante. So behind the influence of these three modes, which are the whole activity, the influence of how everything is being carried out in this world, is the hand of the Lord. But is he directly involved? No. He does it through his agencies. He makes the rules, he sets the thing in motion, and then and his agents, the demigods, carry out how things happen. And they are more or less the controllers of the modes. So it's all, it's interesting, very scientific arrangement of how creation works, how existence works. If you study, especially Krishna book, which is an expression of Bhagavatam, and also other parts of the Srimad Bhagavatam, you can learn in the most detailed way how everything works. And that helps you to see your own self within that, that, whole, that larger cosmos. And then you can start to learn how to extract yourself from the influence of these modes. The direct way is to engage in devotional service. But until we come to pure devotional service, we still have to somehow or other make sure we don't get trapped by the influence of the modes of material nature, which are always working to bring the living entity into act in one of these three characteristics, either self-destruction, selfishness, or in the mode of goodness in order to enjoy material happiness. Goodness, kind of a... So, therefore, by knowing how it works, you can start to see how to get out. <laughs> and you can also see how you're influenced, too. <laughs> this is nice. So Krishna is simply watching us. <laughs> is he judging us? No. Krishna doesn't judge. He's only watching to see what he can do to encourage us to turn our head towards him. <laughs> That's the only thing he does. Well, he does it in such a way as to move the material energy in such a way that we want to turn our face towards him. And he's also telling us directly. Krishna's in the heart. Sometimes people ask, well, if Krishna's in the heart and he's speaking to us, how do I know which voice is Krishna? <laughs> hmm. The question comes up. Because we might say there, we might say there's other voices in the heart. There's the voice of the false ego, which is encouraging the living entity to act on the desire for sense gratification in different ways. So how do you know that voice? It says that there's two ways. There's the there's the perfected way, and then there's the way that that you can achieve perfection and still understand that voice. Therefore, the super soul, or Krishna in the heart, manifests himself externally as the spiritual master. So he's called the external manifestation of the, spirit, of the super soul within the heart. So, when we hear from the spiritual master, we're actually hearing from Krishna within the heart. <laughs> we're actually hearing from Krishna within the heart, directly. Because he's speaking only what Krishna wa wants him to say. Just like Prabhupada was asked one time by devotees. You know, I think Prabhupada got every question that ever existed, ever. <laughs> and Prabhupada dealt with so many questions. And he always had the perfect answer. And it was amazing. How, and some of the answers were always like... They weren't what we, we expected to hear, but they were perfect. <laughs> and so Prabhupada was asked, well, you know, the, the spiritual master is the re pure representative of God, 
then Prabhupada, do you know everything? <laughs> and Prabhupada said, I'm not God. <laughs> but I know what I need to know. In other words, he knows how to engage and direct and correct his disciples on the path back to Godhead. That's his credit. And Krishna tells him directly how to do that through his own power of devotion to Krishna. And so, therefore, we can learn what Krishna wants directly from Krishna's representative. And then, when we come to the stage of actually pure devotional service, or when the mind, as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, becomes free from happy, the attraction for happiness and distress, lamentation and illusion, then one can hear Krishna within the heart. And then you can check to see if that is actually Krishna by checking it with your spiritual master, if it lines up. So this is the way to actually understand if we're on an, actually on the right path. Like that. But as we become purified, then Krishna in the heart directs one towards him in pure devotional service. This is the process. Okay. Um, this chap, this particular paragraph goes on and on. Should I continue? Maharaj? Let's go to questions. Okay. So we can take some questions on what was said so far. Um, okay. <clears throat> I'm wondering what some of the main points are that we're supposed to take from the first nine cantos before we read the tenth canto. Some of the main lessons and, and the reasoning why we're supposed to read it thoroughly. Who are you asking? I think he's asking you, Mark. <laughs> That's what I think, anyway. He looks like he's looking right at you, so. <laughs> See, I brought up the nine cantos. So, the, the, the author or compiler, Vyasadeva, wanted to reveal Krishna. That was the instruction from Narada. So, to, to enable the reader or the audience hearing from Shukadeva or Sutta Goswami requires step by step by step when hearing about the pastimes of Krishna to understand who he is instead of part of the relative realm he's from the absolute realm and the first nine cantos are constructed in such a way to assist one to understand that Krishna is the absolute truth. And then Krishna appears. And then Krishna's pastimes. So the first nine cantos are to assist. Before Krishna appears, the transcendental nature of the absolute truth, and that's him as a person. Otherwise, one can hear about a person and think of a worldly person or a special person, but a a product of the material creation instead of otherwise. Okay. Mataji, you had a question? No? I thought you had your hand up. Yeah? No? Anyone okay. else? Um, Marash, um, Chantraboli Marash, about the liquid, liquid, liquid beauty example that you gave. Um, in one sense, um, although, as you explained, we have to see everything or all things that are beautiful in relationship to Krishna, and that's what's real substance. Um, we still seem to make discrimination of what is beautiful and what is not beautiful, or 
what is more beautiful like that. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 you're still considering a little bit, you're making some, there's some, you're not seeing necessarily equally of, you know, this type of things. Like Krishna makes, you know, in the 10th chapter, all these marvelous things, you know, he right. points out. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems that we're still making some discrimination of beauty according to the, the forms and like that. Oh, Can something you explain out, a little bit on that? Something outstanding. Something powerful, something outstanding. Something that everyone recognizes above them, the normal material modes. Not above the modes, but something extraordinary. Yeah. But then again, you want to, it depends on how you want to look at it. Lord Chaitanya says, now what is that? That some say this is good and some say this is bad. But this is all my mental speculation. He says, what is it? Badra Badra Jnana Sakale Samadhi He Manda He Bala He Brahma He says that some people say this is good and some people say this is bad but this is all mental speculation. So Prabhupada goes on to explain, he says everything in the material world is bad. <laughs> because it's material and it's temporary and it's completely opposite of our nature as spirit. So if you want to take it from that perspective, yeah, that's one perspective. The other perspective is how Krishna says it in the Bhagavad Gita. That he uses these things to help us see him, himself within the material energy as something wonderful based on the material energy. But then again, he doesn't leave it at that. At the end of the ver chapter he says, but on, with a tiny spark of my splendor, I support and pervade this whole entire existence. This is only a drop uh, in comparison. So the material at, at best can be used as a comparison to help indicate something wonderful which is beyond us, our ability to understand. Just like we, we describe Krishna's color as a tamal cloud, beautiful black as rain cloud. But it's more than that. <laughs> That's, that's the best we can get. He has lotus eyes, he has lotus feet, but because the lotus is so attractive and so colorful and so, what we say, nicely, it has beautiful contours, it's, its shape is so attractive. So we compare that to Krishna. <laughs> but ultimately, it's just a tiny indication, not even that, of what, it, what is something that is so wonderful we can't even understand. So it, it depends how you want to take this material analogy. It's, it's relative, it's a little better than relative, it's useless. <laughs> From different angles of vision, that's all. And a question for Chandramali Swami Maharaj. Maharaj, uh, you were talking about the two voices, like the super soul and uh, whether it's our own mind, uh, and then we have to confirm with our spiritual master in that. Suppose there is a situation that we cannot confirm from our spiritual master, and but we are praying very intensely, like for some decision we have to make. So. So how, how can we be guided that, like, how can we be 100% sure it's not So wrong? basically you're saying there's no access or opportunity to consult your spirit. So consult another senior devotee who can also maybe help you understand things. That's the safe way. I mean, Prabhupada says Krishna consciousness is common sense. <laughs> So, in order to do day-to-day -day things, we use our common sense. <laughs> Sometimes we have trouble with that one, too. <laughs> but beyond that, if there's some philosophical thing that comes up, or 
how to best serve in a particular situation, and you can consult other devotees. But use your intelligence. <laughs> Prabhupada said, try to use your intelligence to execute Krishna consciousness. And he said, if you don't have any, go look for one, someone who has it, who can help you. <laughs> Ultimately. So, we have resources on different levels. <laughs> Okay, does that help? Yes, Maharaj. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Uh, this is a question for Maharaj. Um, Maharaj, you mentioned in your lecture that the verse, you quoted the verse, Janma Karma, Chame Divyam, and Emam Yaveti Thakpata, so one should know in truth. So, I will break my questions. Um, the, my first question is that, what is the position of Bhakti Mishra Jnana? the person who is performing jnana with bhakti. What's the position? Yes. The, he will see... Could you clarify Bhagavan. your question? What's the position? Position means he will see truth Krishna as a Bhagavan or what, what, what is his position? What, what kind of realization are we having? By the ah, incomplete. Directional, but not complete. A picture that's out of focus is a nice example. You see the object, but it's not in focus. Yep, uh, that's right, Maharaj. Um, so, by the Vidya potency, he may see Paramatma in his heart, not the Bhagavan. No, no, that, that, you're speaking of a, a meditator, a meditator a who's actually seeing super soul within his heart, and now you want to know what's that person's position? What's your question? So my question is now that here. So, since he is seeing Paramatma in his heart by his knowledge, and uh, at the same time, Prahlad Maharaj was also seeing Paramatma in his heart. So, what's the difference between these two Paramatma? Well, Prahlad was. Prahlad. You're saying Narada or Prahlad? Prahlad? Prahlad. Saw the Lord in his heart? Sorry, Dhruva, Dhruva Maharaj. Dhruva Maharaj. Okay, Dhruva Maharaj. Well, he was a Bhakta. And how did he, he saw Lord Vishnu, not from the position of a Dhyan yogi, but from the position of a bhakta. Because he had received bhakti from Narada. He was doing dhyana for sure. He was doing meditation, but so was, you know, in the mood of devotion, just like Kapila Dev. He teaches the process of meditation that brings one to the position of pure devotion. Which is exactly what your question is, mixed. But his, 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 his approach to Lord Vishnu was, I want a kingdom. But it was personal. He, be, he was a devotee, that's why the Lord appeared. And came. He's, it's, Yes, he was engaged in, so I, I don't, I'm not sure, you're looking at me like I got a hole in my head or something. <laughs> That's normal. Okay. Do you engage in meditation? Are you a, a jnani or a dhyani? You're a bhakta. You engage in meditation. And you see the deity. And you meditate on the form of the deity. So meditation doesn't mean you, you can't be a devotee. You've got to be, it's in, it's in a bucket over there, and then there's the, the, this bucket over here. Dhruva was engaged in devotional service. The process, the age, was Satya Yuga. So there was a meditation procedure connected with it. He was a bhakta. So the per, the person the gnani who is having paramatma realization incomplete paramatma realization um, for example he has received a mantra from his guru maharaj a gnani bhakta a gnani gnani not a bhakta but a gnani person who has realized he has received the mantra from his guru maharaj and is doing that mantra did that mantra will help you to go to the Bhagavan realization? By, no. Well, it's, it's the person who gave him the mantra. The giver of the mantra is Narada Muni. 
Supposing a jnani picks up a book and finds a mantra, the Hare Krishna mantra, they chant the Hare Krishna mantra, they're not going to get Bhagavan realization. The source makes a huge difference. And the source, the connecting with a bhakta, transmits or transfers bhakti. Even the seed of bhakti, but th that seed of bhakti can grow into the mature. I think his question is sort of a little mixed. Well, well, I was thinking his intention was to get a kingdom. Well, that's, that's, so his intention was a kingdom. No, it's just, well, if you, you, your understanding is different than mine. <clears throat> it's not where his intention was coming from. It's he saw Suprasol and that it, it, it's, yes, he saw Suprasol and that, this, that same Suprasol from the, the Sweta Dweep came before him. The Suprasol disappeared and then he was standing in front of him, talking to him, touching his head with his conch shell receiving his prayers, reciprocating in a loving mood because Dhruva was a bhakta. Not... Nani is performing his meditation, so he'll be seeing the same Lord of Sweta Deepa with the four hands or different... Well, if he's very fortunate, And the fortune comes from the source of the source of fortune. Does, if he does, it's good fortune. But he, what will he see? Just like a very nice example. When Krishna enters into the wrestling arena of Kamsa, there's this wonderful verse that says all the people who were in that assembly they saw him differently. Correct. So the without listing the different people who saw him in different ways, Krishna simply reciprocates according to one's disposition towards him. So they may see by good fortune, and they'll see differently than you will see, or Dhruva saw, or the pure devotee will see, because of that disposition of heart. Krishna reciprocates according to how we regard him. Okay, one more question. Oh, do we have no. another question? No? Okay. Jitendri has a commentary. Well, I was just thinking, you know. Uh... <laughs> Maybe this would be applicable. Uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So, according to their disposition, it's the same thing, but it just came to mind, you know. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. That's another definition of beauty, yeah. Okay. Shiva Kaupad Ki Jai.